The title of my sermon this morning is Negotiating with God. Have you ever done this? Do you ever not do this? I'll take my scripture from Habakkuk 1, verses 5 through 13. Some of this will be stuff we've covered a little bit before. But I believe that the book of Habakkuk could have been written in 2020. And they would not have had to change many words to do this. I think it is very timely and relevant. Now, I want to talk a little bit before we jump right into Habakkuk. Habakkuk is grouped with the minor prophets in the Bible. Now, they're only called minor not because they're not important. It's because of the length of them. The major prophets are big, long books. Isaiah, 66 chapters. I believe that's the, that's the second biggest book in the Bible behind Psalms. And the minor prophets are shorter. And so they called them minor prophets, but they're not minor in what they say. So there's several big themes that come up over and over in the minor prophets. Truths, we would say. The first one, and I believe our musicians have testified to this greatly in, the, in their song choice. God is actively engaged in the events of the world today. And that in itself is a complete thought and, and a complete sermon. He is not passive or hands-off even when we don't realize what he's doing. God has, in order to give us a choice in life, God has made his activity subtle. If you consider creating the world and all of us and, and all that he's done, it's subtle. It is, he did it in a way that we can choose, we human beings can choose to ignore him. Please, faithful believer, never mistake that for God not being actively engaged. Minor prophets just hit that one over and over. Secondly, and this one is a little bit oblique to us in some ways. We are Gentiles, but God still has future plans for the Israelites. That is a big theme of the minor prophets. It's a big theme of the Old Testament and a big theme of the New Testament. The book ends with Revelation, the book of Revelation, and it's all about God still has future plans for Israel. There are still unfulfilled promises that God made to the Israelite people, not to the Gentiles, to the Israelite people, specifically, specific promises that he has not fulfilled. And so if he has cast off the Israelites, then he is a God who lies, and we don't believe that. Nobody believes that. This is an important point because some people have taught this erroneously. The Christian church, what we're doing here today, has not replaced Israel. We have not taken their place any more than a parent will replace one child with another and cast off one in favor of another. Let me say a good parent and a, a parent who acts appropriately will never cast off one child and replace them with another. We love them all. The third major truth of the minor prophet, God means to save the Gentiles. Now that was specifically the minor prophets were talking to the Israelites and he says, yes, there is another child other than you Israelites and that is the non-Israelites, the Gentiles. And God means to save the Gentiles. We are currently in the period of the Gentiles. And we have church because God means to save the Gentiles. The door was opened. At the cross, the gate was opened wide for the world. Christianity is not locked into a culture. It is not locked into a language. It is not locked to any agendas other than God has opened the door of salvation, the choice of salvation to all people, everywhere, all the time. That is the message of Jonah. God sent Jonah, an Israelite, to Nineveh, the Assyrians, who eventually would conquer and take away the ten northern tribes of Israel. Uh, Nineveh is a metaphor for wickedness in the Old Testament. 
and God sent Jonah to Nineveh to say repent. The Lord is a Lord who will judge. Repent before judgment day. And they did repent for a while. We are in the period of the Gentiles and that will culminate with the return of Christ. Christ initiated the period of the Gentiles, the open door. I would also call it the biblical period where the Bible is complete, the canon is complete. We have the truth in our hands. Now it's uh, on, on us to follow the truth. Uh, and it will culminate with Jesus coming back. So what do we do with these truths? Well, it's not hard. The, the Christian church is generally Gentile now. There are Israelites and uh, Jews that, that accept the Messiah and get saved. But m for the most part, the Christian church is Gentile. Our job, Jesus laid it out just real straightforward. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And we love our neighbor by living all the time. And speaking the truth out loud. Okay? Not just sending good vibrations their way silently. But we, we have to speak. If, if no one tells them, they will not know. Let me tell you a story about negotiating with authority. This, is, this was my daddy's favorite story to tell about me. Uh, I, and I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, he told it incorrectly, but we often do that with, with stories. I, when I was a young man, I'm, I'm sure I've told you this before, um, I loved to play Civil War. I loved to play Army. I loved Tarzan. You know, I loved Daniel Boone. Um, I loved Cowboys. I mean, that was a generation. I grew up with Daniel Boone and and all that all the time on TV. And so my mom is a genius for making kids costumes. I mean, Ellie grew up every Easter. She'd say, Grandma, I want to be an elephant. And we would get a costume of an elephant. Grandma, I want to be a parrot. And she got a, she had a parrot costume. It was a little wonky, but it, it was amazing. Um, and I was the same way. When I was a kid, so I said, Mom, I want to be Tarzan. And she made me this leopard skin fur um, swimsuit that I wore. You can imagine. Don't go too crazy with that. And so I went and I got a tree, a big tree limb, and I made me a spear. And you know, you've watched Tarzan. When Tarzan would throw a spear, it would go straight and it would, you know, stick in a tree or or one of the, or an animal, or, or a savage, or something, and it was amazing, and I wanted to throw a spear like that, and so my daddy had a bunch of fertilizer sacks on, on the carport, and I just had an imagine, you remember being a kid, you just, you see stuff on TV, you, you imagine it, I just imagine throwing my spear, and it's sticking right in those uh, fertilizer sacks, and I threw it and it just punched a hole and fell to the ground. So I was disappointed. I went on, didn't think anything more about it. And my dad came home and my dad was, you know, he was a stock foreman at Great Lakes Carbon. So he, he paid attention to the order of things. And, and he was very displeased that there was a big hole in his fertilizer sack. And I will say there was only one hole. The story conflated over the years to there was a, a hole in every sack, and it was not. And, but that's immaterial. So he got ready to whip me, and and I, you know, we went out, and he showed me the hole, and he told me why he was going to whip me, and he got out his belt, and I'll tell you, that was the great fear of my childhood was getting a spanking. And, and I'll tell you, it, it is an effective deterrent to, to disobey. And he got ready, and I bent over, and I said, Dad, how about we make a deal? I said, if you won't whip me. Now, as he told the story, 
There were holes in every bag. And I said, Dad, if you won't quit me, I won't make the holes any bigger in your fertilizer sack. Now, when he told the story, he said he got so tickled by me saying that that he didn't whip me. That is false. <laughs> okay? I did not find that he, I did not realize that he found that amusing until years later when the story had been told to everybody he knowed over and over. Now, Rex got a whip in that day for making a hole. That's, and I insist, I mean, we can, we can talk all day and, uh, about your ideas about things, but I think I have some character today because there were consequences for my actions then. But the point is, I got the whipping because I had done wrong. And we don't negotiate with those in authority above us generally, especially with God. So the main idea of this, of this sermon is that to negotiate with God which we, I think we all do all the time. God, if you will, then I will. Is to misunderstand God's nature and purpose. It is to think that maybe we know something that God doesn't know. And we have a will that supersedes his will. But that's what we find in the book of Habakkuk today. So as let's review a little bit. That what gets us, there are, we've already heard one question from that, and we'll get to the second question today in Habakkuk, that Habakkuk asked God. We begin back in verse 5, where God tells Habakkuk in response to his original question, why is there evil? How long will there be evil? He said, look among the nations, the non-Israelites, and watch. Be utterly astounded your God is at work for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told to you and we we talked about this last week and uh, and this was the Babylonians he was going to send the Babylonians to punish the Israelites for their sin however within the Bible when we get over to the book of Acts Paul quoted that verse. He was preaching to the Jews in the synagogue in what is modern day Turkey. And he quoted this verse to them, but he put a new spin on it. It was not the Babylonians are going to come and punish. The Babylonians had disappeared by that point. He interpreted this mighty work of God to be the coming of Christ, opening the door of salvation to non-Israelites. I am working a work in the Messiah that you would not believe, though it were told to you. And that message was, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, not his own. He had none to die for. He died to satisfy God's justice, God's wrath against your sin. And just to prove that it was from God, he rose from the dead three days later. So now sins can be forgiven. Amen. That is appropriate. Amen. Yes. There's nothing in the human experiment that equals this or parallels this. Nothing. Nothing that man can come up and make a religion up about does this at all. They can approximate the Christian church religion part, what we do, what you and I do, but nothing in the human experience parallels what God did for us on the cross. A work that is astounding, that is unbelievable. No wonder people that, that don't choose to believe want to throw shade on that fact. They don't understand what it is. It's astounding. The world can ignore the cross, but the cross doesn't disappear. That Salvation possibility does not disappear just because people don't believe it. The world calls codependency love. That means I'm going to love you harming yourself. I'm going to help you to harm yourself. They can call that love, but it's not love. True love helps another rise out of their sinful choices, right out of their dishealth. 
loves you in spite of your bad choices and helps you to come out of it. Do not fall for the lie that to love somebody's sin is to love somebody. That is being pushed down our throat. And that is from the devil. People call it hateful when I say this. If somebody listens to this that is not born again and that does not agree with me, they, they think I'm talking hatefully. But man has never known love like the cross. There's no parallel. Again, that you are wrong and you are deserving of wrath and I come and take that wrath for you. That is love. Not to say, well, let's just, let's, from this point forward, let's call that okay. And let's clap when somebody does wrong. That's garbage. God's vehicle, back in the day, when Habakkuk wrote this to his original audience, was the Babylonians. And they were bad people. And they were powerful people. And so I just, I abbreviated it, but I want to go back and look at characteristics of the Babylonians right quick. For indeed, I am raising the Chaldeans. That's, that's a later name for, the Bal for that region where Babylon is. A bitter and hasty nation. Bitter, bitter about the way the world is and hasty in their solutions, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that is not there. Who feel that they have the right to come into your home and take it. He describes the Punisher in Habakkuk 1, 7 through 11. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity, their self-opinion proceed from themselves. They are the source of their power. They, come, they all come for violence. They want to tear down. What is there before them? They gather captives like sand. The Babylonians will not let you stay, think differently than they think. You must submit. They scoff at kings, the power structures that are, the things that, that have gone and worked. They deride every stronghold. whether it be the Constitution or the church, this force that is coming, their own power is their God. And this pursuit of power, they pursue it like we might pursue God. I think it might be safe to interpret Habakkuk in light of Christians in our modern world Christian, if you act ashamed of the cross, you will be punished by people who think the cross is shameful. If you are passive, you will be punished by people that think the cross should be ignored. That's a hard, that's a hard truth. And Habakkuk thought so too. I like Habakkuk. He speaks for me. And he wanted to question God on this. Again, these people, these punishers, they gather captives like sand. No one is allowed to disagree. So Habakkuk's first question to God, and we've already covered it, God, what are you doing about evil? How long are we going to have to endure this? The answer God gave him, I'm sending the punisher, punisher to chastise my children for embracing and turning a blind eye to evil. We've already said that's, that's a hard pill. Now we get to the prophet's second question. Habakkuk. 1 verses 12 and 13. Habakkuk says to God, Are you not eternal from everlasting? O Lord my God, my Holy One, 
we shall not die. Surely it's not in your plan to wipe us out. Oh, Lord, you have appointed them, those awful people, to judge us. O oh, rock of my salvation, you have marked them for correction. Surely, surely you mean to punish them and not us. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. Lord, how can you look at the way the world is today and not judge them? And cannot look on evil. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? And hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. Why are you not punishing them rather than punishing me with them? In other words, Lord, haven't you made a mistake? You see, unfortunately, we believers are of the flesh. We want to win the spiritual, and we will. The Bible promises when you've asked Jesus into your heart, at that last heartbeat, you'll be in paradise. You will win the spiritual battle. But you know, we also want to win here and now in the flesh. We want politics to go in a way that pleases Christ. Politics is worldly. And, but we want our poli politics to be stamped by God and for him to push a political agenda. And it's because we want to win eternally and we want to win now. We might say, God, shouldn't you use the church to punish the godless. It's an odd thought. The hard truth of Habakkuk is that negotiating with God demonstrates a lack of knowledge of God. Who do you think you are? It also demonstrates a lack of appreciation of what God has done. And a lack of trust in God's plan for you and the whole world. Habakkuk says, be careful. It's okay to feel the way you feel, but remember who God is as you feel those feelings. Do not for a minute think that you know better than God what to do with this world. So what? What do we do? None of this is going to be shocking. This is what we do with this knowledge. Are you worried about the evil in the world? Notice that God punishes his people with godless people. That's repeating the thought we've already had. Look inside yourself and see the ways that you have not lived for God. And if you can't find any, check yourself in somewhere because you are blind to yourself. Our number one commandment is to love God with everything. And remember, to know God and to know the mind of God is to love God. That's scripture. Read your Bible daily. If you have not developed that habit, find a way. I, I don't have a magic formula to give you. Find a way. And it's not, reading the Bible is not a magic trick, but it is saturating your mind with the wisdom of God. And it's a it's a long-term project that will pay you every day. Second, to love God is to speak to God. Develop your daily prayer life. Improve what you're already doing. Talk to God continually. Pray to recognize God's sovereign hand in the chaos of your world. Do not forget that. If Habakkuk tells you anything else, he tells you that God is active, especially when it doesn't seem that he is. That's faith. Number two, we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, And that's a lot harder. 
that's a lot harder than loving God. My challenge to you is to do acts of kindness this week or, or maybe an act of kindness to a neighbor who does not expect it. Every now and then, me and Sarah get a coupon for Krispy Kreme donuts. Buy one, get one, dozen free. And I tell you, I, I, I quote Tim Hawkins, that's like eating a baby angel right there. Oh, that is good stuff. But we three do not need to eat. That's eight apiece. Or in other words, I eat 12 and they eat six apiece. Uh, and we do not need that. Nobody, nobody, I'm preaching against that. Nobody needs that many donuts. Get a box and give your neighbor who does not expect it a box of donuts. And say, I give you that because Jesus loves you. Next, as I just said, make sure that Jesus gets verbal credit for your kindness. Time is short. Time is short. There's no more time for modeling Christianity. We got to speak it to. Period. It's too easy to dismiss kindness. Next, pray for people in your life, personal and on the news, that make you the most angry. That is what Jesus did on the cross. And you know what? You and I were the ones that made him angry. Try not to be spiteful in your prayers. That's, C is the hardest thing, I think, in this whole sermon. But that is the key for us, y'all. If we cannot love our enemies, then the game is over. So, you know, as I've already said, I was not in a position to negotiate. We negotiate with equals. We're not equal to God. But I will correct my father's story. There was only one hole. That was one correction. I'll give you another one. I was not clever enough. I was only about nine years old. I was not clever enough to negotiate with him. He told the story as a negotiation. What I was giving him, the belt was out and I was giving him repentance. I was saying, Daddy, if you don't whip me, I know what I did was wrong. I won't do it no more. That's what I was saying. It made a good story, but I was repenting. But I tell you what, when God pulls the belt, it's too late. That's judgment day. We've got time though. We've got time. What Habakkuk is telling us as we, as the people of God, are the ones that need to be repenting right now of what we have done, our lack of shining the light of Christ in this world, that it gets to this state, that people can make the mistake that we are not about, that we are about hatefulness rather than about love. That's on us. The message of Habakkuk is, Christian, repent of your sin. God is very aware of your needs. God knows what you need better than we know what we need. Proper response to a chaotic world is repentance for your own sin. And then this thing that we talk about all the time, asking God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to help us to seek holiness in our everyday life. Let us pray. God, it's a lot easier to point out other people's flaws than it is to live repentance. Lord, I pray for myself this morning. Lord, help me repent of my sin. Help me to repent of my passivity. Help me to speak boldly and appropriately 
of your good work, your work to save mankind and to love mankind. And Lord, I pray that your way and your work catches fire in this world and heals this land. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.